I'm a psychiatrist. I trained in medicine about two or three hundred yards from where we are in Bart's Hospital. And at a very early stage as a medical student, I became very interested in the phenomenon of psychosis. Psychosis is a deeply misunderstood, frequently misused term, frequently abused term, and sometimes abusive term. And it broadly refers to when somebody experiences a reality that other people don't share. Formally, it's described sometimes as losing contact with reality. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about what that entails, but I should begin by saying that probably my earliest reflective experience of psychosis was as a medical student in Hackney Hospital, um, speaking to a young man who'd been having messages from the newspapers and the television that became more and more aggressive, more and more frightening, and in the end caused him to uh, cut himself very, very severely. I was personally very affected by this, and also intellectually, uh, by this question that really prob seemed deeply problematic to me then. This was an intelligent, articulate, thoughtful young man uh, who seemed to inhabit the same world that I did, and yet whose experience of that reality was very, very different. And really, since uh, going into psychiatry subsequently and going into research in the field, I suppose you could say that I've been grappling with that problem ever since. And I have to admit at the outset that it's not a deeply successful wrestling match and I'm probably uh, just about surviving it. But I'd like to lay before you some of the ideas that I think may be helpful, may be f informative as we consider the nature of this loss of contact with reality, psychosis. I should also um, acknowledge that it's not a term that everybody accepts, including people who are said to suffer from psychosis. And I think that's something we need to respect and think about. Jerome Lawrence uh, came up with a slightly crude, but probably quite informative distinction. He said, a neurotic is someone who builds castles in the air, a psychotic is someone who lives in them. We don't tend to um, use this distinction so explicitly nowadays, although it's still implicit in a lot of psychiatry, insofar as we can, um, we can differentiate between people who create these castles in the air, these fears, uh, terrors, obsessions, ruminations, but who at the same time are aware that they are products of their own mind, who do not see them as being real. And the people who actually consider these castles, these, these apparitions and phantasms, to be a reality. And I think this, this quote captures that nicely. Uh, he also said something that I don't quite like as much, um, which is that the psychiatrist is the person who collects the rent, and I disagree with that. So having set up this distinction, uh, I now want to dismantle it and really show to you that it's not anywhere near as clear-cut as is apparent here. And the overview of my presentation is really as follows. I'm going to begin by just asking a little bit more deeply, what, what is psychosis? Why is it so difficult to comprehend? Um, how can we begin to understand the mechanisms by which psychosis may arise? And when I say understand the mechanisms and think about explanations, I really don't just want something that is a redescription of psychosis at another level, whether that's in psychoanalytical terms, psychological terms, genetic terms. I think we need an explanation or some consideration of mechanisms that appeal to multiple different levels of explanation, right down from the molecular up through the computational, the cognitive, up to the sociocultural. And I think that's the, the quest that we're on. And I think that a starting point is to just ask ourselves, what are the challenges that face the human brain in trying to survive and thrive in a complex, noisy and ambiguous world? I'd like to suggest that what we, the conclusion we come to is quite an old one, that the, the brain itself is a device that makes uh, inferences that are often predictive. And don't worry if that's not very clear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack that. In the end, I think we're left with the uncomfortable idea that perception itself uh, experiencing and comprehending reality is to some extent a form of a controlled hallucination. Uh, I don't entirely agree with that, but it's a very current idea in, uh, in cognitive neuroscience now. 
And as a consequence of that, I think that we can think of psychosis not as some gross loss of function, as some incomprehensible deviation from reality, but actually potentially subtle shift in the balance by which somebody processes the world. And this is really my overall conclusion, just to, to leap ahead, which is that the brain or the mind is essentially striving to make sense of the world. And in doing so, it's almost an occupational hazard that it renders itself vulnerable to a creation of reality, a deviation from reality, a loss of touch with reality. And that is formally the definition of psychosis. So psychosis is, in the textbooks, uh, generally defined as, as comprising hallucinations and delusions. Hallucinations are abnormal perceptions of the world. So hearing, seeing, saying, or hearing, seeing, touching, tasting things that aren't actually objectively there. So it's formally defined as a perception in the absence of a stimulus. A delusion is an irrational belief. Now I actually don't think that this distinction holds because when we look closely at perception and the nature of perception, it has a belief-like component to it as I hope to show you. But before going on to that, let's just imagine what a hallucination might be like. This is from a young woman I was asked to see out in uh, Peterborough, uh, near, near Cambridge, where I, where I practice. Uh, and her family were getting very worried about her because she'd be, been growing increasingly isolated, saying odd things, not really engaging with them and with life as she had been used to. And this is one instance, uh, or one in uh, experience that she described. So having a fight with her sister, she's only 17, um, I run to my room and then I can hear her whispering about me, calling me names, telling people lies about me. Uh, and I said, is, is she outside your room? Is that how you can hear her? She said, she was very specific. No, she's still downstairs or sometimes even when she's outside the house. Um, I don't know how I can hear her so clearly, but I can. This woman was experiencing voices, auditory hallucinations as we term them. Here's an example of a man who was experiencing very much the same sort of thing as the, as the young man I alluded to earlier. Uh, they're talking to me on the news, reading the news to me. The new re news readers have said things to me. Um, now, it's one thing to describe the experiences. It's another to have the experiences. And of course, many of us, although psychosis is much more common than we might think, uh, may never experience these phenomena. And about... Um, Four years ago, I was approached by a video game company in Cambridge who wanted to make a game which was a very serious and dark game in which they wanted to represent the nature of psychosis. Uh, the company, Ninja Theory, ended up developing this game called Hellblade, which um, turned out to be very, very successful in more than one way. Uh, it was successful in it, it sold a lot of copies, much to everybody's surprise. Uh, but it was also successful in, a for me, a much more important way. And that was that they wanted to get things absolutely right and respectfully so. And so I worked very closely with them to talk about theories of perception and psychosis. We also worked with groups of individuals who themselves had experienced psychosis. And they were able to use those experiences in an iterative way to build up uh, some of the phenomena that then went into this, this video game. And I'm just going to play you a little of... Um, how they represented auditory hallucinations. And these were based directly on conversations with people who'd had such experiences. Now, I should warn you in advance, this is a dark game. It's quite a distressing experience. So if you do want to cover your ears, then um, I quite understand. Coward. 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 So these very frightening, uh, critical, hostile, aggressive experiences, it must be absolutely awful to have this sort of thing happening all the time. Um, and this is one of the challenges for me in psychosis, as is illustrated by this uh, 1950s video from a hospital in America. Um, the person experiencing this can very often be completely dissociated from the reality that most people around them have and totally immersed 
to the exclusion of everything else in the world that their own mind is creating in its phantasms and experiences and voices and visions. And this poses us with a real challenge to come up with the sort of explanation that I've alluded to that we, we should be seeking. You know, how can we say something about, let's say, the brain in psychosis uh, when it's clearly a very creative, constructive process to, to have psychosis? It's not some simple, gross loss of function or derangement of function. And that's our, our starting challenge. So this brings me to the next point, which is what, what, what does our brain normally do? What, what is it there for? Which is not a question one hears very often. Now, what must it achieve and what are the challenges in, uh, in achieving that? Now, of course, m most of us, I think, would like to uh, see the, f the foremost role of our brain or mind as uh, philosophy, art, poetry, all of the, the higher endeavours. And the fact that so many people come uh, to something like this on a sunny afternoon is a suggestion that most of us do want to engage in higher endeavours, education, improving ourselves, although I can't guarantee to improve you, I'm afraid. Um, but actually, I think there's a more fundamental tack that we can take, which is to say, well, first and foremost, like all of our other organs, the brain is in involved in the basic business of survival. Um, and survival entails, first and foremost, stability, maintaining the stability at a biological, physical, and chemical level in the face of a world that will do quite a lot to try and upset that stability. And I was very influenced by a paper that was written in 1972 that I came across you know, only a few years ago. And it was actually written by a psychiatrist, Ashby, and a cybernetician. Uh, and it was putting forward what became known as the good regulator theorem, the idea that if anything's involved in regulating a system, then it must become a model of that system. It must recapitulate within itself the associations, the regularities of that system. And they made a very, very striking uh, comment here. They said this theorem has the interesting corollary that the living brain, as far as it is to be successful and efficient as a regulator for survival, which it must be, um, it has to proceed by forming a model of its world. Now, I think that is a deeply, deeply profound assertion. It may seem very obvious to many of you, but uh, it struck me quite forcibly. And it presents us with the problem that we have, which is the brain has very little to go on in becoming a model of the world. Now, it might seem to most of us that the brain is directly in contact with the wonderful reality around us. But actually, it is deeply encased within the darkness of the skull. Uh, luckily, the skull has some holes in it, and through those holes we get electrical signals that are being passed via the various sense organs. And these are enormously complex and multiple in their input. So essentially the brain is getting this, and it has to somehow reconstruct those electrical signals into the reality that surrounds it. And how could it do that? The first point to note is that it's not, we're not direct recipients of reality. We're actually decoding the signals that reality is sending us. Now, Hermann von Helmholtz, who was a, a 19th century um, scientist and polymath, he made the following statement, which will need a little unpacking, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. He said that objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision as would have to be there in order to create the same impression on the nervous mechanism. Now, that takes a little bit of thinking about, but what he was essentially saying is that we have impressions on our nervous mechanism, these incoming signals, and we imagine the objects that could have caused those. Vernon Mountcastle put it more poetically uh, and perhaps more clearly. He said, each of us lives within the universe or the prison of our own brains, projecting from it are millions of fragile sensory neurons arranged in groups uniquely adapted to sample the energetic states of the world heat, light, force, chemical composition. That's all we can know of it directly. Everything else is pure inference. So he was saying the, the brain is receiving these signals about energetic states, heat, light, force, and so forth, um, and then it has to infer what, what is out there causing them. And Charles Peirce, uh, who was an early 20th century American philosopher, uh, actually referred to this sort of inference as abduction, a-B-D-U-duction. Uh, 
Essentially, it's reasoning backwards from the data that you have to what might have caused those data. So the example I give in the transcript is I might see something black and reason that it's a raven. That's abductive inference. And unfortunately, it's the most fragile form of inference one can imagine because it can be wrong in so many ways. This black object might be a cat or it might be something else. There are so many ways in which I could get an impression of a black object on my, my retina or in my brain. And what Peirce pointed out and what has subsequently been thought a lot about is that we optimise our inference by using what we already know about how the world works. And this is a key insight that our prior knowledge, our expectations govern how we process the world. So the example would be, um, if I see this black object and it happens to be sitting at the top of a tree, then a raven is probably a, a reasonable abductive inference. If on the other hand it's uh, rubbing up against somebody's legs, then a cat is surely a better inference on that basis. Knowing things about other things can help us to uh, disambiguate the, the, uh, the data that we're getting. And it's very important to recognise that the data we're getting are very ambiguous. So this is just a picture, uh, an imagining of somebody seeing a bottle and the impression that they get on the retina, which is a two-dimensional impression, could be a bottle that's placed this distance from them. On the other hand, it could be any one of an infinite range of possibilities from a a very tiny bottle that's very close to them to a very big bottle that's very far away. There is nothing in the data itself that actually tells you what the answer is. What tells you what the answer is is what you already know about the likely size of bottles. And of course we can play around with these perspectives and, and give examples where if we place the bottle close to us and the person far away it produces a, an interesting little <coughs> phenomenon. But we still aren't fooled. We still don't actually think that this is likely to be a very big bottle of water or a very small person. Now this, this phenomenon of what we know determining how we interpret input has become critical to the sorts of experiments that, that I've been doing in looking at psychosis. And we've used stimuli of this sort, um, which to many people who haven't seen them before will look like rather noisy, black and white, blobby images. But to me, this is a very clear image. Um, and the reason it's very clear is that I have some prior knowledge that you haven't yet been given. To me, this is a clear image of a woman who's young, who's got a hat on, who's happy, and who's kissing a horse. And the reason I see that is because I've seen this image from which it was taken. So if you actually flick back and forth between them, it becomes possible to just discern the uh, the clearer image within this uh, whoops, black and white one. Now I won't labour the point, but the, the, the essential point is that knowing what is actually there helps us to disambiguate, or knowing, uh, or having an expectation, if you like, helps us to disambiguate. Now this works very nicely in the auditory domain as well, so I'm going to just play you a little sound here. So to many people here, I imagine that's going to sound fairly incomprehensible, rather ugly clockwork bird song. To me, again, it's very clear. And the reason it's very clear is I, again, have prior knowledge. And my prior knowledge is this. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. So if I now play you the first sound again, with your prior knowledge, it should be clearer. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. So that should be almost effortless to discern now that you just have a little bit of prior experience that enables you to resolve the ambiguity. So the take home message is having something that's already in there helps us make sense of what's coming from out there. And it, you can actually use these sorts of stimuli to, to ask some very fundamental questions about how our brains are processing the world. And this, this is a study that was I did with uh, my close colleague Christoph Teufel. And we both became very, very interested in certain areas of these images where there's objectively nothing there. So if we, if we look at this patch of white here, objectively on the paper or on the screen, there is no stimulus. It's just a little bit of white. But in our prior knowledge, it's the young woman's jawline. 
And what Christoph and I both started to notice was that when we became very familiar with these images, we started to almost hallucinate what should be there, to experience what should be there even when we knew it wasn't. And Christoph asked this very sensible question, are you fundamentally processing that area of the image in a different way, depending upon whether you have the prior knowledge or not? And he set up a, a, a nice little experiment to test that. So I'm just going to briefly describe that to you. Um, yeah. So he took er areas of these images that objectively don't have any actual stimulus there, and he placed upon them little patches which had a, an embedded contour or edge. Now, I've made it fairly obvious here what the edge is. You can just about see it. And it's in line with this invisible jawline. Um, and then he changed the contrast so it became fainter and fainter and fainter. And he measured the threshold at which people could see it or could, could pick it out. And he did that both before and after they had the prior knowledge. And he compared that to instances in which the edge was orientated at 90 degrees to the hidden contour. So what the essential question was is moving from before to after having the prior knowledge, is there a change in your threshold for detecting these edges? Because if there is, it's actually suggesting that this prior knowledge is fundamentally changing the sensitivity of your visual system. And sure enough, what he found was, um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the, the key point is this. If the contour is um, aligned with the invisible contour, if you like, if the, the patch has, a, has an edge that is aligned with the invisible contour, then your sensitivity from before seeing this to after goes up significantly. That doesn't happen if the edge is at right angles to the invisible contour. So just knowing that there should be something there is enough to increase your sensitivity to something being there. Your prior knowledge increases your sensitivity, essentially. So what I've essentially said so far is that if we use predictions based on our spatial temporal correlations and past experience and knowledge, we can enhance the efficiency with which we process the world, as you heard with the, the two sounds, became much clearer to process that unambiguously in efficiency, we can improve sensitivity and it helps us, I'm sorry, helps us deal with an intensive, delayed, um, ambiguous signal. So it's a great strategy for dealing with the world, but there's always a but and this is it. What if what you're doing is something creative in your perception? You're no longer just passively receiving the world, but you're adding something to it. Now that's starting to sound perilously close to hallucinating which is perception in the absence of the stimulus. So what if predictions increase sensitivity to something that isn't there? What if they create something that isn't objectively there? That is a hallucination. So uh, psychologists love visual illusions, and this is one of the classic ones, the so-called Kanitsa triangle illusion. Now, because of the array of black shapes underneath, people find it very difficult not to perceive that there's a sort of white phantom triangle hovering above. Um, because that would best explain these, these uh, shapes behind it. And even though there objectively is nothing there, it's very hard not to see the outline of the white triangle. Just the simple uh, array of black and white shapes causes your visual system to produce a triangle that really doesn't exist. Now this, um, this I, I should say formally this is really an illusion, which is a misperception rather than hallucination, which is a perception of something that isn't there. But actually I think it's a very blurred distinction between the two. And Edmund Gurney, who wrote a very long and detailed tract on um, hallucinatory phenomena in the 18th, 1880s, I think, um, he referred to illusions as like fragments of hallucination being sprinkled onto our perception of reality. And I think that's a good description of this. Now, Hippolyte Ten, who again was involved in theorizing about perception and hallucinations in, uh, uh, in 1870, wrote this uh, essay, De l'intelligence, which, in which he said something very important. He said, external perception is an internal dream which proves to be in harmony with external things. 
Instead of calling hallucination a false external perception, we must call external perception a true hallucination. Now, this has subsequently been uh, developed in the, what's become quite a catchy phrase now, perception is controlled hallucination. What that's trying to capture is the idea that perception isn't all about what's out there, it's partly what's in here. So I want to give some examples of, of how our brain can add to external reality or even overwrite it or recreate it. And one good example of that, I think, is, is called binocular rivalry. So binocular rivalry uh, essentially involves using a special apparatus in which you present one image to one eye and another image to the other eye. In this case, it's a face to one eye and a house to the other eye. Now, you might imagine that if you get that experience, what you would actually perceive um, would be a sort of mixture of face and house all in one messy blob. But the reality is that what people perceive is either a face or a house. So they perceive a face for a while and then that sort of fades away and a house comes in. And then they, that fades away and then the, the face reappears. Now that's suggesting that somehow what you're doing is creating one of the image or the other in your perception. The suggestion is that because it would be very out of keeping with your prior experience to have a house and a face occupying the same space, your brain will only allow you to see one thing or the other. Now, an interesting thing happens if you then play around with these stimuli. So you present one half of the face and one half of the house to one eye, and the other half of the house and the other half of the face to the other. Now surely you think you get a bit of a messy perception here, but no, what you actually get is either a face or a house. So, so the brain is essentially reconfiguring information from the two eyes to best fit with what is a more probable explanation for what you're seeing. Now there's probably even a higher level of brain using predictions to, to create perceptions. Because a, a study was done in 2010 in which the experiment has presented uh, flowers to one eye and marker pens to the other, you know, those sort of felt pens to the other. And they pervaded the room with the smell either of flowers or of marker pens. And if you were smelling the flowers, you were more likely to perceive flowers. If you were smelling the marker pens, you were more likely to perceive marker pens. So there's this higher level of explanation that's feeding its way down and saying, no, this is more likely, this is what should be perceived. Another nice example is the famous rotating mask illusion, in which, um, well, I'll show it to you, it's probably the best way of... This is the heart. Sorry. This was uh, first shown by Richard Gregory, the Oxford uh, neurophysiologist. And essentially this is a classic um, plastic hollow mask of, of Charlie Chaplin. And the interesting thing that happens is, as it rotates around and as the facial features become visible to you, it's very difficult to see it as hollow. You tend to see the features sticking out rather than sticking in. So it produces quite an, an odd sensation as it, as it revolves. And the suggestion is that because we are so used to faces and we have specialised systems for processing them, it's very difficult to um, override those systems which know deep in themselves that faces don't stick in, they stick out. And so when you see facial features, you cannot help but see them as being convex rather than concave, as sticking out rather than sticking in. Now another example of this, and one that I, I rather like, is the so-called McGurk effect. So. Um, this essentially is suggesting or showing that input in one domain, the visual, can overwrite your, ex your perception in another domain, in this case the auditory. So the, the best way to explain it to you is to show it. Ba, 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 ba. So this man is just uttering the monosyllable, um, which... I'm assuming many of you will have heard as va 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 va. Now the reason that you hear it as that is because of the, the movement his lips are making. Because if I play you the same sound but his lips are making a different movement, then the experience is rather different. Ba, 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 ba. So I assume most people have heard that as ba rather than va. Now you might disbelieve me and think that I've played you a different sound. So what I'm going to do is play them both together. 
And in order to experience this, what I suggest you do is look at one side and then shift your attention to the other and then back again. And what you'll hear is the auditory experience fundamentally changes depending on what you're looking at. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. So for many of you, that would be a very striking experience that uh, essentially what you're seeing is determining what you're perceiving in the auditory domain. We're overwriting, we're recreating perceptions as a consequence or with a need to fulfill what is expected. And there's a higher level of doing that sort of thing, which has always fascinated me. So this uh, handsome fellow is Ivan Muzhukin, who was an early 20th century Russian matinee idol. And there was a, a, a director, Kulyeshov, who um, interspersed clips of Muzhukin emoting to the camera um, with other clips of film. And those other clips were of differing types. So in one instance, it was a dead person. In another, it was an attractive woman. In another, it was a delicious looking plate of food. And he played these interspersed clips to the audience who all raved about how good Mujukin was at creating the facial expressions associated with sadness, with lust, or with hunger. What they didn't realize was it was the same facial expression each time and that all that changed was what they thought Mujukin was looking at. So although we all tend to pride ourselves on our ability to read facial expressions, a lot of that is determined by our expectations about what's going on in the person's mind. And this Kulyeshov effect is, is a really nice example of that at, at a very high level. So I said previously that we have this way of dealing with the world that involves using prior expectations to determine how and what we perceive. Um, and there was a but, and I think the but can be summarised as that our strong expectations can actually create perceptions. Uh, they may overwrite the actual data, and that the system as a whole can very easily deviate from an objective reality. And so now I think we're in a position to take those ideas and apply them to the initial question, how can we begin to understand the psychosis state? And I think what it involves really is a sort of rather unnecessarily complex model that I've put here, but it's really just trying to capture this idea of several levels of balance within the mind or brain, wherein we've got expectations coming down based on our prior knowledge, and those are interacting with the input to try and create a balance. Now, where they fail, there'll be an error, a prediction error signal that goes up and tells the system, no, this isn't right, you need to change the expectations or change your explanations. And the system will then say, no, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to see what I want to see, not what you're telling me I should see. And so the idea is that there's this sort of negotiation between what we expect and what we're getting, and that somehow we create our perception as a sort of, if you like, um, you know, best guess based upon that. With the overall aim being to sort of settle the system down, minimise prediction errors. Now, the idea is that at the top level are our sort of abstract general expectations about how the world works, how people are, what they think of us, what we think of them, are they trustworthy, all these very high um, sort of complex understanding of the world based on our past experience. Whereas at the lower level, it's much more about physical structures. Is there a contour there or is there not? But in all cases, the suggestion is we're using expectations to filter down and somehow negotiate our way towards an agreed reality. Now, this offers us the opportunity. This is just a working model. I won't pretend that this is in any way capturing the full complexity or that we can map it onto the brain directly except in, in very minor ways. But it does allow us to speculate on what might happen when the system is perturbed in differing ways. So one thing that might happen is that we can somehow have a disturbance to the input. In other words, we cut off the sensory input to a particular domain. Now the suggestion is what would happen here is that we get an overbalancing. We no longer have the input. So the, all of the weight is in what we're predicting. And the suggestion would be that we um, essentially create a perception based upon what's already in there because there's nothing coming up from the world to, to, um, to actually counteract that. <laughs>
And this is what we see in something like Charles Bonnet syndrome. So uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome was first described in 1760, uh, in which Charles Bonnet was actually writing about his father who had begun to show a retinal degeneration. And he'd started to hallucinate phenomena. He'd started to see birds and buildings and faces. Um, the suggestion would be that we can understand the Charles Bonnet syndrome as a consequence of this sort of imbalance. And we get a similar effect with sensory deprivation. If you put somebody in a very darkened tank, try and remove all of their sensory inputs, within a short space of time they'll be hallucinating, quite floridly and profoundly. There's also the phenomenon of the prisoner's cinema, where if, prisoner is, if the prisoner is in a darkened cell in solitary confinement, within a short space of time they have experiences of lights moving across in front of their vision, sometimes seeing faces, um, a cinematic experience when there's, there's nothing there. Now the striking thing here I think is that um, because, oops, sorry, because uh, this is just affecting the lower levels, there's no reason why the upper levels shouldn't be able to function normally. And it is the case with Charles Bonnet syndrome, with the prisoner's cinema, with sensory deprivation, that the person actually may have hallucinations, but they recognize them as being unreal. They don't believe in them. They don't, don't become truly separate from reality. On the other hand, it might be the case that we could have a chemical disturbance that's influencing um, the neurotransmission that is mediating this balance, LSD, psilocybin, ketamine, or some neurochemical uh, alteration perhaps caused by illness, um, alcohol withdrawal, for example. All of these could fundamentally perturb the system and lead to experience of a change in the balance so that the person's consciousness or perception deviated from reality. We also get instances where um, a person may undergo an experience so deeply traumatic, so adverse, that actually their, their higher order beliefs about the world and how it works become ruptured. They no longer see the world or the people in it as a trustworthy place. And of course, if this happens at a very young age and over a sustained period of time, it's entirely possible that these will be the prior expectations that the person carries through their life. Now, those prior expectations will shift the balance towards the predictions the person makes, so that uh, these could percolate down, so that if they're thinking that everybody's untrustworthy or intent on doing them harm, they'll begin to actually physically perceive them as being aggressive. Maybe their hand gestures or maybe their facial expression, as we saw with the Kuleshov effect that I alluded to. So there's a number of ways in which this simple model can help us to think about uh, the nature of psychosis and the many ways in which it might arise. But of course the key question and the, the, the one that I'd like to tackle in the last part of my presentation is um, can we actually turn this into something that will generate scientifically testable hypotheses that will allow us to, um, if you like, put our money where our mouth is? And I'm just going to present very briefly three pieces of evidence from my own and other people's work uh, suggesting that it is possible to, to, um, to generate experiments that can formally test these ideas. And just to summarise them, I'm going to show you briefly that um, if, we can if we find people in whom there's an altered integration of... Oh, sorry, in people in whom there is a psychotic illness... Uh, we can find evidence that they're failing to integrate stored experience and current input. Or not so much that they're failing, but they're doing it in a different way. The second piece is related to that. Sorry, this isn't... Uh, essentially suggesting that a, a drug that can change that integration experimentally will also produce the same effects of change in reality, of psychosis. And then finally, we can find people who are prone to hallucinations, and we can try and measure how they set the balance, if you like. So I'll just go through each of those one at a time. And this is using uh, functional brain imaging uh, in Addenbrooke's hospital. And I'm probably going to have to uh, go over and point because my point has given up the ghost. So essentially, we had people who had psychosis, uh, just very mild, early stage, and some matched control subjects. And we measured their brain response to two types of stimulus. 
One was when having, firstly, we, we set up some expectations and then we either violated those expectations to create a sort of surprise or prediction error or we fulfilled them so that this, the, the, the stimulus was highly predicted. And we measured how the brain responded to those two types of stimulus. And what we see in our control subjects is that there's a significantly greater response in this area of the frontal lobe to the surprising compared to the non-surprising stimuli. But in the people with psychosis, we find that this relationship has changed, that there's just as much activity when the outcome is predicted compared to when it's uh, unpredicted, suggesting that we are seeing this change in integration of um, the prediction error or the, the integration of what, what's expected with what the input is. Now, you can then give healthy controls uh, a drug called ketamine, which will produce a mild psychotic experience. I hasten to add that I wouldn't give controls anything I'm not prepared to have myself, and I've experienced this. And it's, a, it's not an altogether pleasant experience, but it is one that you can quickly get over, just to reassure you. And what we find is precisely the same thing. So if somebody's, on the, the subjects who are taking the placebo, we find this right frontal region responds in just the same way uh, to the surprising compared to the unsurprising or predicted, but the drug produces, again, this, this distinct uh, change. Um, and I'll just put the two graphs next to each other so that you can see. So this is from the, the patient study I just showed you. And this is from the same brain region in the effects of ketamine. Now, there have been a whole host of studies that have come out over the last couple of years. And I, I'm not going to go into detail, but a lot of them are starting to show that there's change in the way people are making predictions in association with hallucinations and other symptoms of psychosis. And the final piece of evidence is one that goes back to these black and white images that I showed you earlier. And this is my colleague, Christoph Teufel, who, who led this study. So essentially what we did here was we showed the same sorts of images to people who were prone to hallucinations and to uh, control participants who weren't. So they'd see the black and white images in one session and they were simply asked, can you see a figure in that or not? And by and large, this is quite difficult, as, as you would have spotted the first time you saw the black and white image. It just looks like a mess, like a noise. We then spent a session showing them the template or the coloured images from which they were derived, and we then tested them again on this. Now, Christoph's hypothesis was a very interesting and unusual one. He suggested if, if somebody's prone to hallucinations, they should actually be better at this task, because what we're, we're suggesting is that a hallucination is caused by a strong top-down, a strong predictive response. And of course, a strong predictive response is quite an advantage here because you're using what you've already seen, and that prediction is allowing you to disambiguate or make sense of this image. Now, I agreed with this hypothesis, but I really didn't think that we would find what he predicted we'd find, because it's so often the case that if you test people who've been subject to the stresses of mental illness, they simply don't or can't perform as well. But in this instance, he was absolutely right. So if we look at our control participants, this, this is how well they perceive, it's their sensitivity on this axis. Before they've seen the coloured image, uh, both groups are performing at a pretty low level as we expected. In the control participants, once they've seen the image, in other words in the after, they become more sensitive, more able to do the task. Again, no surprises there. But the critical difference is, look at the improvement in people who are hallucination prone. They're clearly able to use that prior information much more powerfully, significantly more powerfully, in order to uh, carry out and complete the task. So what this is suggest suggesting to me is that, um, you know, the notion of a balance uh, as, a, as, a, as a cause of psychosis is an interesting one because it also allows for the fact that different people have different levels of balance under normal circumstances. Some of us might be more prone to using our prior knowledge to create our world, others won't. Uh, and although that might make you more vulnerable to hallucinations, it might also have advantages in the way in which you process the world, if it can be kept under control. But that's just speculation. So to summarise uh, and draw this to a conclusion, I th I, the point I've really tried to make is that 
We're faced with this enormous challenge in perceiving and comprehending the world. And ultimately, it can't be a passive process because if we just passively receive the signals, we would be like babies. We wouldn't be able to make any sense of them. We have to use uh, inference and creativity based on what we already know. I think as a consequence of that, it's an integral part of the healthy system that there's a ready-made tendency to experience what is not there or to bend the perception of what is there according to prior expectations, according to what fits with what you already know. That is a very, very useful way of going about things, but it does demand a fine degree of balance and that balance can be shifted by many factors. Tiredness, stress, grief, traumatic events, chemicals, um, deterioration within the uh, sensory domain. All sorts of things can just shift that. And if we're, if we're unlucky or not careful, then we can deviate from that reality. And that's the result of 20 years of wrestling. <laughs> it's not much, but it's all I've got. So, so what? I mean, you might say, well, congratulations. You can retire happily. You know, you haven't done anyone any good. I, I, I am very humble about... Um, what, what has actually been achieved here. I, I think there's an enormous way to go. But I do still feel deeply, and it won't be me who finds it out, but somebody, I hope, will, that the mechanisms by which these phenomena arise are so crucial to understand um, at many levels because they can inspire or help us to refine either treatments or interventions or help. So that can be at a personal level. People with the Charles Bonnet syndrome take a lot of comfort from knowing that their hallucinations are not real. Perhaps people will begin to uh, at least have some sense of understanding um, if they know the mechanisms by which things like hallucinations arise. It can also be brought into cognitive therapies. So I will often use the um, perceptual illusions to explain to people who are very distressed by their experiences, to explain to them that actually our, our brains are making up the world a lot of the time and that what, what you're experiencing, it, it may be horrible, but it can be understandable. Um, behavioral treatments and ultimately maybe pharmacological treatments. I mean, drug treatments in psychosis can be very unpleasant and we're always going to be looking out for ones that are much more precise and direct. But also, I think and, and this is the last thing where I'd, I'd really like to finish on, is I think understanding these mechanisms really encourages and supports much richer research and communication. Not just communication between scientists and clinicians, but between people generally. I think we're all in the business of trying to build a model of our world. And I think we define ourselves uh, and our place with others by the nature of our models and the degree to which we share them with others. A consequence of that is that if your model is unshared, if your picture of reality is unshared, it's a terribly isolating and stigmatizing experience for many people. And it can also lead other people to respond very aggressively because it's so hard to understand someone who simply will not see your reality. I think that encouraging this sort of thinking and, and acknowledging that all of us are a little bit um, out of touch with reality, if we're brutally honest, might actually contribute to some tendency at least to destigmatize the conditions, which is for me absolutely key. And when the, when the video game that I mentioned was released um, in 2000, late 2017, uh, one of the most inspiring and, and really edifying things for me was the number of messages that I and the video game company got from people who'd had experience of psychosis themselves, uh, saying that they, they were so grateful that somebody had made an effort to actually represent their reality so that they could then share it with others. And this is one message I got from a woman which uh, was, was very touching because it's often so hard to have direct impact on people and their lives. So she said, I suffer from schizophrenia and after playing Hellblade, I found myself in awe. It's the only piece of media that I can find that accurately represents what it sounds and feels like to have schizophrenia. I'm writing to you to thank you because thanks to your work, I can now show people who are close to me how scary having hallucinations really is. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to make more of the game than was. I think it, it falls short in some ways. But I think just 
the degree of positive feedback that we've had from people who are just glad to be able to say, okay, this is what it's like for me, and I can now show it to somebody, is, is very important to remember. And on that note, I should thank all of my collaborators. I haven't got time to mention them all, but it's very important to recognise that this is, is always teamwork, and I've, I've been very fortunate in the people that I've been able to work with. So on that note, thank you very much indeed for listening to me. <laughs>